was going to. Um, okay, so this morning, um, Jack is presenting as a committee. That's the Justice and Access Committee. And I have the problem of continually calling it the Jack committee like and i also say atm machine it's redundant but just whatever it's our group and we'll be presenting this morning um a training on microaggressions that we have called the ouch oops training so i'm gonna share my screen here we have a presentation we've got some videos we've got some role play for you um so Okay, so hopefully everyone is able to see this. Everyone's able to see, right? Yeah. Yes. My biggest fear is my biggest fear is technical issues. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit of kind of how the training or the idea for it came about. Um, interestingly enough, about nine years ago, um, when I worked at Rock Valley. I actually went to a conference on microaggressions and had no idea what they were. I didn't even know what I was going for. And now these years later, I'm actually helping to train others on them. So the idea for our training came out of discussions during our JAC meeting, since one of our goals is to help increase staff's knowledge and awareness of just the issues um, going on around us. And Amy had been to a conference, I think it was a conference, and learned of um, what's called the ouch oops method, which we will be demonstrating later on in the training. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea of what it is, something that Eric and I have done in the last couple of years in the IL module, which you all go through when you're a new employee, we have a section specifically devoted to disability etiquette. So this training we're kind of thinking of as diversity and inclusion etiquette. Um, so what we'll be doing, we're just going to be looking at the definition, what actually is a microaggression, the effects of it, why does this matter? Um, again, we've got some scenarios presented by our team members, and then I've got a short video presentation um, of a TED Talk to show you as well. And then we will wrap it up. Basically, what is a microaggression. Um, a professor of counseling psychology at Columbia University, his name is Dr. Darrell Wing Su. Um, he's a pioneer in the study of microaggressions and how he defines it is microaggressions are everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environmental slights, snubs, or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to people based solely upon being members of a marginalized group. Um, so that's a pretty intense definition. So we'll take it apart and we're gonna look at a variety of microaggressions, like I said, and then role play some for you too. And something that was really important in our group discussion about it is that the last thing Jack wants to come across as is, oh, we're the language police now, or we're going to give you a list of things that here, don't say this or start monitoring how people talk. And it's not the idea at all. Um, the idea is that language and culture constantly changes. And every one of us comes to the table with different biases, different cultural aspects of our own, um, and all the change going around can be frustrating. And so instead of being frustrated by the change and then being ignorant of what's happening, we just want to kind of give the idea of keeping an open mind and keeping the dialogue going. And as I was creating the training, um, there are a lot of different figures out there for this, but on average, humans speak about 15,000 words a day. And that would be 5,475,000 words a year that we each speak. So in those words, we're bound to say something that we didn't want to say. 
that's ill-advised, that's hurtful, that we wish we didn't, that we accidentally said, or we put our foot in our mouth. And then, you know, 15 years later at three in the morning, we'll wake up and still be thinking about it. So we all do that. And the goal is simply to try and be more aware going forward of how what we say affects other people and different choices that we can make. So what do microaggressions do to break it down a little bit more? Um, they either, they can affirm a stereotype about a minority group. They can belittle members of a minority group suggest discomfort about a minority group, presume all minority groups are the same, or minimize or deny bias against a minority group. And when we're talking minority groups or um, what the original definition said, marginalized group, we're talking about um, groups based on race, gender, disability, class, sexual orientation, all of those type of things. So the next thing I want to do is I want to play you an, a, an example of a microaggression. And this is just, um, this is a short, like a 40 second video. And it's funny because it was from 2017. And some of you may be familiar with it because it was everywhere. It felt like everybody saw it. Um, and it sort of highlighted the problems of a dad working from home and being interrupted by his kids, which now we're all used to. Um, and the microaggression doesn't happen in the video. I'm going to show you the video, but I'm going to then explain sort of the fallout that happened um, afterwards because of it. So let me figure out now. I'm going to show you this video here. Uh, and what will it mean for uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift it, shifting shifting sands in the region. Do you think relations with the north may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the um, pardon me. My apologies. <laughs> What was this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months. Okay, so we go back to our presentation here. So again, the microaggression was not within the video itself, but there was so much talk. You know, everyone thought it was funny. Everyone thought it was cute. Everyone, you know, saw a dad being interrupted by his kids. But the big deal was when the mom came in, which also was a funny moment. But so many people um, talked and chattered about how um, the woman who came in was the nanny. She must be the nanny. Oh, she must be afraid. She's going to get fired. You know, there was all this talk of that poor nanny. Um, and they ended up actually having to go on and be interviewed first to address just the sort of funny issue of it, but then to address that she's not the nanny. She's his wife. She's the mother of his children. Um, and that's just an example of what I had said earlier of a microaggression of enforcing a stereotype that just because she's Asian, she wouldn't be his wife or the mother of the children. She would be the nanny. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the effects of microaggressions because um, micro means small. So if they're small, if they're little, they must not be a big thing. You know, why do we have to make such a big deal about them? Like, why does everything have to be about race or, you know, disability or sexuality or whatever? Um, and while they may appear to be harmless, or sometimes they may even seem to sound like a compliment, maybe telling a person of color, like, oh, you're so articulate. Inside, 
they contain demeaning hidden messages that can often come from our own unconscious biases that we carry around with it. And employees or you know, consumers or whoever who are frequent targets of microaggressions can experience health problems, burnout, other negative effects, and it's it's been called death by a thousand cuts. So just a lot of little insults and aggressive acts over time. Um, and to look from like a health and physical and mental perspective, this is from the Center for Health Journalism, microaggressions, and I'm just gonna kind of rattle off some of the things they can cause. They cause traumatic stress, and the stress is linked to negative mental health outcomes such as depression, anger, physical reactions, avoidance, intrusion, hypervigilance, and low self-esteem. It's also linked to poor physical health directly and indirectly, including heart disease, lower levels of cancer screening, and reduced adherence to medication for chronic disease. It's linked to unhealthy behaviors such as overeating, consumption of fatty foods, decreased exercise, to substance abuse, and including marijuana, alcohol, and tobacco. And in a sample of 405 students at an undergraduate university, depressive symptoms were the link in the, re in the relationship between racial microaggressions and thoughts of suicide. So not only do microaggressions harm physical and mental health, then they can undermine trust in service providers and caregivers. So that those seemingly little thousand cuts can eventually cause death, you know, and then we may cover up or we may hear people covering up microaggressions be like, oh, I was just joking. You know, I didn't have any idea. I get so sick of having to be here all the time. Um, but they truly have serious effects on people. Um, so the next thing that we want to do is we've got some scenarios that we would like to act out for you. And let me I'm gonna stop sharing my screen there. And um, we've paired up to share a few scenarios with you. And before we do, um, I did not like go to my bookshelf and pull down, you know, the big book of microaggression scenarios. Um, I asked our team, guys, give me the ones that you hear. Give me the ones that people say to you because um, they're happening to us all the time. So these are real things um, that we've heard. Yes. They're scenarios that were written, so they sound scripted and a little cringy. We got that, and we had you know, fun hopefully acting them out, or we will. Um, I've got a couple of them that um, are recorded because our Jana had an appointment and can't be here with us. Um, but yeah, these are real, and of course, they're not going to wrap up neatly like we do with all of these. You know, you may have more uncomfortable conversations with people, but we just wanted to give you some examples and um, of microaggressions and why they could be harmful or hurtful to people hearing them. So the per first team I have up is Jackie and Amber. So I will let you get to it. Okay. Something's up with this copier. I can't figure out how to stop it printing my stuff on 11 by 7. Can you help me out? Sure, let me take a stab at it. Ouch. What's the matter? Are you okay? I'm all good, but there are certain idioms we use that have violent connotations, such as take a stab, give it your best shot, doing a drive-by, and lots of other things we say without thinking about it and can stir up pretty negative emotions for people affected by domestic violence, gun violence, etc. Oops, Amber, I never thought of that. But now that you mention it, wow, you know, pushing someone over the edge, I'm at the end of my rope, bringing out the big guns. There's a lot of violent imagery in our catchphrases. It'll take some work since they're so ingrained in how we all talk, but I'm going to look for those now and I will try not to use them. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Our next one um, is a video that Ren and Jana submitted. So I will share this one with you. We've got, let me see, just so you are mentally prepared. We have six total scenarios. So. Hang on, I forgot to click the button for the audio like I always do. Hey Jenna, what are you reading? Oh, I'm checking the news to see where we're at with the vote on the Equality Act. What's that? It's a bill that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity in things like employment, housing, public accommodations, public education, federal funding, credit, and the jury system. It's really important. Hey, as long as gay people aren't gay in my face, I'm cool with it. Ouch. What you just said sounded pretty homophobic. When people say stuff like that, it actively hurts those of us in the LGBTQ plus community. Like we need to be ashamed of who we are, um, living a normal life and having relationships like hetero people. There's so much bias and brutality, including murder towards queer people, that requesting us not be in your face feels kind of threatening. Oops, that's pretty intense. I didn't think about it that way. I was raised old school and never really learned about that community much, but I wouldn't ever want someone to feel threatened by something that I said. I think I'm gonna read up on it and get some information. Let me know if you have any recommendations. Yeah, I'll send you some links. Okay, clearly that was Eric and Jana, not Ron and Jana. Um, and now Eric and I have one that we will do. Okay. All right. Hey, Alice, did you watch NCIS last night? Jimmy's wife died. They didn't say why, but you were left to believe that it was the China virus. Ouch. <laughs> why? What's wrong with that? Well, even though in the past it's common to call a virus a name related to where it originated, Calling coronavirus China virus already has resulted in increased racism against anyone who may be Asian, let alone Chinese. Just between March and June of last year, over 2,000 incidences of hate crimes against Asians were reported in the U.S. and they keep increasing. So it's a lot more accurate and safe for our Asian friends if we call it by its actual name, scientific name, COVID-19. Uh, oh, that's horrible. I didn't realize that had such a negative impact on people. Seriously, that one won't be hard to switch. I'll make an effort to remember. And I have to add, you guys, I seriously lifted that out of a text conversation that I had like a week ago. So um, next up, we have Carolyn and Mark. Okay. Good job, Harry. So Carolyn, how's your day going? So crazy. If I have to deal with one more thing, I'm going to go insane. Ouch, that sounds insane, intense. But you know, I'm trying not to use crazy or insane to describe negative situations. It can be marginalized. It can marginalize people who are experiencing mental illness. Illness, that's one in five Americans. People at higher risk can be hurt, homeless, and discriminated against. Oops, but everybody says those words. Nobody thinks they really mean that. I get it for sure. And I, for, I forget sometimes myself. I've tried to make an effort to find substitute words or be more specific, such as intense, stressful, out of control, or my personal favorite, bananas. <laughs> Whatever works for you, it's actually sort of fun to get creative with it. I'll be honest, this one may be hard for me, but you're right. I've got people in my life with mental illness and they're worth me making an adjustment for. I really want others to have dignity and feel safe. Okay, thank you. Now I will do our video of Ron and Jana. Good morning, Ron, great to see you. Great to see you too. You know, I just wanted to tell you, participating with you on this meeting is just so inspirational to me. It's really amazing. 
Um, thanks, but why? Oh, just the fact that you're here, you got up this morning, got ready, came to a meeting. You're an inspiration to us all. You really are. Well, didn't you do the same stuff to get here? Sure, but that's normal. I didn't have to navigate all the incredible obstacles that you had to overcome to be here. Well, the obstacles that I have to overcome don't make me inspirational or anything different than you. It's just something that I, I have to do to get here just like you do. Oops, I can see where that came off as patronizing. I'm sorry, and thanks for clarifying. That really helps me out around other people with disabilities. Now I know not to offend them. Thanks for letting me know, and I truly do think the extra effort you put in and the creative solution you found for your consumer you shared about at Last All Staff is inspiring. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. Have a great day. You too. Yes. Okay, and then um, Ron and I are actually up next with our final scenario number six. Are you ready, Ron? Okay. Yep. Ron, you did a great job at the board presentation. You are so articulate. I mean, it's wild. Like, you don't sound black at all. Ouch. What does that mean? You know, like slang, like jive, you know, ghetto. Isn't it called like Ebonics or something? You don't sound like that. You sound regular. Okay. Whoa, there's a lot to unpack there. First of all, what you're calling Ebonics is actually a recognized language by many linguists, and some black people don't even feel comfortable using it. And it's a natural way of speaking, just like any other dialect. Oh, okay. So, oops, now I'm thinking about it. If a black person speaks standard English and then also that, they're almost bilingual. So now the educator in me is thinking like, that could really be helpful, like in a school setting, if I could get someone, that would be a big draw if I could get someone to speak both that way. Yeah, not exactly. You see, the problem is that by calling standard white English regular, you're already setting up the mindset that quote unquote white English is superior, which makes some people in the black community feel like they have to talk that way to be successful. Do you see the problem? I do, okay. Okay, I'm I'm absorbing it, um, and I definitely I want I want to learn more. Um, so thanks for filling me in. No problem. Have a great day. Okay, so those were like I said. I know that they were pretty scripted, but those were just some ideas of things that again we may run across frequently either at work amongst each other or we're working with our consumers or in our personal life, family, friends, etc. Um, the next thing I want to do is I'm going to show you a pretty brief TED talk. It's about nine minutes um, on this topic and it covers a few more. Um, so we tried to give you a number of, uh, of them, but she gives a more comprehensive idea of microaggressions, some examples and then what we can do to avoid them. So let me this up here. The formal definition of a microaggression is listed behind me. Simply put, microaggressions are insults that are rooted in stereotype and they're directed at someone because of their membership within a marginalized group. 
Now, because they are rooted in stereotype, they limit a person's ability to be able to uh, see people as individuals. In 1970, Dr. Chester Middlebrook Pierce, a professor at Harvard, coined the term microaggressions to describe insults and dismissive behavior he witnessed black people enduring. But now the term has been um, expanded to include um, offensive comments and behaviors that are directed at anyone in a marginalized group, including but not limited to women, people of color, people with disabilities, and people who are older. So one of the things about microaggressions is that they're very prevalent in society, and I could do a full day's discussion about that. Um, I actually developed a training um, that I share with companies to help them address offensive comments in their workplace. We're just going to go through a couple examples here today. But it's important to note that we all have biases, and anyone can be guilty of making a microaggression or being subjected to one. So why does it matter? Well, for some people, just being themselves can be a revolutionary act because their very being is crushing stereotypes of who and what they should be. Microaggressions wound people. If we were to compare it to getting a paper cut, one paper cut is manageable, but paper cuts all over your body is something quite different. And it's this accumulation of offensive comments in social settings and professional settings that begin to take a toll on a person's spirit. Microaggressions can be an amorphous concept, but it's my hope through the examples I'm gonna provide for you that I can provide a more definitive understanding. Microaggressions regarding disability are prevalent. For example, Making comments like, I'm so OCD about my files, or ugh, I can't read today, I'm so dyslexic, when someone does not actually have dyslexia or OCD, can be perceived as a microaggression. These phrases are examples of ableist language, and they trivialize something that is quite serious. For some historical context, I want to discuss what happened when the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed in 1990. The ADA makes it illegal in employment to discriminate against someone because of a mental or physical disability. It also guarantees access to buildings and to public and private transportation. Shortly before the act was passed, several disability activists came to DC and they climbed the 83 steps outside the Capitol building. They met at the base of the stairs and they got out of their wheelchairs, they took off their crutches and any kind of assistive walking devices and they dragged or crawled themselves up all 83 steps. Now, I like to share this story because it's a good reminder about um, the historical exclusion that people with disabilities have had to face. And it's also a good reminder that there was a group of people that felt so disenfranchised, so marginalized, and um, so unseen that they felt the need to do this. Microaggressions regarding race are also very plentiful. Some people might be surprised to know that professing colorblindness can actually be a form of a microaggression. Examples would be, I don't see color. I was raised to treat everyone the same. I work in a diverse environment. I was in the Peace Corps. It's important to note, <laughs> that, is, that is funny. Uh, it's important to note that um, mere proximity to people of color does not make someone woke. Um, nor, <laughs> nor, nor does it make them automatically knowledgeable about social injustice issues. These comments actually deny the existence of people of color's experience in the world. And me personally, I've seen these phrases used in a, a defensive posture when someone's being challenged about something that they may have said that's offensive. What it actually does is shut down conversation and it allows stereotypes to continue. The last microaggression that I want to talk about is the phrase, that's so ghetto, or that's ghetto. Now, Saturday Night Live has done a sketch about this phrase, and it's tossed around in the workplace and in professional settings. Um, but this phrase can be very offensive to people, and I'm going to provide some historical context as to why. 
So the word ghetto is an Italian pronunciation. The word is used in 1516 to describe an area of the city where Jewish people are living in the city of Venice. Then in 1899, the word is being used to describe where minority groups are living in the city. And again, it tends to be a low income area. From a US perspective, the word has been associated with black and brown people who live in low income areas. What we're essentially talking about is a place in the city where people are being regulated because of poverty, disenfranchisement, and reasons that point to systemic racism. Now, when I'm talking about systemic racism, what do I mean by that? Well, the GI Bill would be a good example. In 1944, President Roosevelt signed the first version of the GI Bill into, into law. And that bill essentially made it possible for veterans to go to college and also gave them the ability to get low interest mortgages, which this sounds like a really good program and it is. Unfortunately, the way it was administered, it was very discriminatory to black veterans. The Veterans Administration refused to guarantee loans for developers who plan to sell homes to black people. When I'm talking about systemic racism, I'm also talking about redlining. Redlining is the practice of drawing a circle around black and brown neighborhoods and then refusing to give loans to those areas. What I'm also talking about is pushing and shuttling people into a specific area of the city and then setting up situations so that the property remains undervalued. When people use the phrase, that's ghetto or that's so ghetto, it's a way of making fun of someone or something. And for the reasons I just shared, it's not funny. So now that I've given you a couple examples of what a microaggression is, I wanna give you a couple tools to avoid making these kind of a comments in the workplace. The first tool or tip is pretty simple, is pause. Before you ask someone a personal question in the workplace, pause. Before you compare someone to something or to someone else, pause. Before describing someone's personality, pause. And when you're pausing, think to yourself, what, is, what could potentially be the impact on what I'm about to say to someone? Not just my intention, but what could be the possible impact that the way this person could take what I'm saying? Could they be possibly offended? The next thing I want to think about is, is this comment necessary? Is it promoting a growth mindset? Because remember, my number one priority when I'm at work is to be productive. The next thing that you can do to try to avoid making a microaggression is research. As I discussed in the previous example about that's so ghetto, a lot of American English is slang. So before adding a new word to your vocabulary, just do a quick Google search, just to make sure that what you're saying is not offensive. So before I leave here um, this afternoon, what I want to leave with you with is, during the course of this conversation, I've been talking about inclusion and respect, which is important, and I hope that you leave this talk with that understanding. But I hope you also took from this talk the concepts of kindness and human, um, human decency. Um, thinking about something before I say it, that's a form of kindness. And treating people the way I want to be treated is one of the highest forms of kindness. Thank you. OK, so I wanted to just toss it out there just for a minute to you guys. Um, did you want to share, have you observed any microaggressions or things that, you know, you feel comfortable sharing or is this something that you encounter? I can share one. Thank you. You know, I don't know if my mic was on that whole time, so I apologize. Um, so, uh, you know, as a female Marine, I think a couple of years ago, I had someone introduce me to a to an entire like uh, gymnasium of um, of middle school students, and the guy introduced me and said, "Isn't she too pretty to be a Marine?" Mm. <laughs> and Oh, it, you know, in front of a, a bunch of middle school students too, like I felt like it was so demeaning to all of the women in the group. And so, you know, later I 
sent him a long email sort of explaining it like I had to I had to process through it myself. Yeah. Um, you know, especially when you feel flattered by something somebody says, it's really hard to, uh, you know, to dissect it and figure out where the what's bad about it. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? And I don't like I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but this is just a, a, she's my fellow Jack member. But <laughs> so Amber, um, I'm sure could have an entire conversation about um, hair and people wanting to touch hair. And um, I recently read an article that we actually talked about in a Jack meeting of Black women going on job interviews, and this is an article from 2020, and having to pay particular attention to make their hair more like a white style. So I'm not asking, you don't have to elaborate on it, Amber, unless you want to, but I'm just like, hair is a thing, and, you know, don't ask to touch people's hair. <laughs> you know, I, I, I will, because that's definitely a micro microaggression that I deal with on a daily basis. Um, especially since I decided to, when I started going just natural, and then when I so decided to lock my hair, um, I think the biggest re reason why I locked my hair is because of the microaggression where um, I've heard where I didn't know that your kind of hair could get so long, or I didn't know that you guys, you know, have to do so much to your hair. Um, it, it just amazes me that my texture of hair is so different from anyone else's texture of hair. Um, I've had people come up to me like, oh, your hair is so long. Can I touch it? It looks like ropes. Um, no, you cannot touch my hair. Do I go up to you and say, can I touch your hair? It just looks so straight. <laughs> you know, it just it, it's amazing. So it, it gets to the point for me now where I don't allow my children to say the word nappy in our house. And anytime I hear someone say it, we, we don't say nappy headed. Um, we have a different curl pattern. Even as a, um, a white person, you have a type of curl pattern. And so my curl pattern is just a tighter curl than yours, it, it, but it's hair. Um, so I don't allow them to say nappy. We say we have a different curl pattern. And all three of my girls have different curl patterns. Uh, so it just, and it's just amazing how my hair is just a center of conversation or even in the workplace. Um, when I started going natural and I wore my hair in a big puff, and it was another individual, uh, a black woman who wore her hair in a kind of a messy Afro, but she was asked, do you comb your hair? <laughs> so, and that was by management. Management asked her, do you comb your hair? Because to them, her hair looked messy, but for us, it's a different type of way to wear your fro. So, it, I mean, it, hair is very important to individuals who had no control over their hair for many of many of years and I decided that I was no longer going to wear the weaves and the wigs to make my hair look straight and to make it well managed I'm going to embrace my own heritage I'm going to embrace my hair and so I just decided to to lock it up and that's and my hair is, has been the healthiest um, it has ever been in my whole entire life and that's because I decided I'm no longer going to mask my hair just to try to fit in um, this is me. This is my curl. My locks look different from other locks because of the way my hair curls. So um, it just amazes me even today that some women um, of color cannot wear their hair how they want to because of it doesn't look professional or clean. And I, con I constantly get the question, well, is your hair clean? Is your hair clean? <laughs> so yeah, I could, I could go on about it, but I, that's something I deal with. Sorry, that was Sajira. <laughs> <All the time. laughs> She's demonstrating. No, and thank you for sharing. And honestly, in the research for this presentation, I mean, there's entire there's an entire TED talk of no, you may not touch my hair. Um, so I've just got a couple slides left to wrap up. So let me grab it here.
Um, okay, so just a couple left. I think a lot of us feel like when we start talking about this topic, um, kind of like I mentioned at the beginning, nobody, I don't feel, really wants to hurt people. Sometimes we just feel like I can't keep up. You know, I don't know what is the right thing to say and everything changes so quickly and what once was not offensive, now it's offensive and what was used now isn't used anymore and I don't know what the acronyms mean and I don't know what's politically correct and um, yeah, it's just always changing. And I mean, to give an example again, um, talking about the IL module, um, within the last year or so, uh, Eric and I were using a portion from a book that was still, and not in the portion that we were having you know, employees read, but elsewhere in the book, I mean, it was using the terminology of mental retardation, which was completely acceptable in the 90s when it was written. And it is certainly not anymore. And additional examples, you know, names of sports teams, uh, person first versus, versus identity first. What, you know, what are we supposed to use and other words surrounding disability? You know, are we supposed to say African-American or, or black? And, and I remember when it was LGB community and, and now there are additional letters and what one should we use? And is it Indians versus tribal people? Or, you know, what's, you know, what's a Latinx? It, how do you even say it? Is, am I supposed to use it? Um, and I think like the video said, initially, I mean, if you see a term that you're not familiar with, um, Google it first, do a little research. Um, I'm always Googling stuff. I, I'm, I'm not born knowing this either. I Google, is this term offensive? Is this term still used? Where did this term originate? Who's using this term? Um, so kind of get a baseline of knowledge. And then if you still have questions and you have a good relationship with someone from that marginalized community, then you can ask for more questions. Try not to be, and I know this is tempting, but, you know, like have, you know, our gay friend or our black friend or whoever that we immediately go to to ask everything of and they're sort of our source of knowledge. I mean, try to get a baseline of your own, but then I think most people actually really welcome questions and dialogue if it's in good faith and we're not defensive of like, well, what can I say? Um, if you come to the conversation with an open mind and just a desire to, you know, not want to hurt people and want to change, uh, I've used this little example a lot, but it's one of my favorites. Um, I'm, I teach at Jean McNair Elementary School, as most people know, we teach I Belong there. Um, and I had Eric as a guest. And once uh, a fourth grade girl raised her hand because they were going to ask him all questions about his disability. And she raised her hand and said, what is offensive to say to you so I can be sure not to say it? Um, and I think it's just coming with that mindset of just not wanting um, to hurt people. So basic steps, being an ally, who cares? Um, and we do use the term ally quite a bit. And it's, you know, coming alongside people um, and, you know, being in defense of other people, other marginalized groups and being sensitive to what they're going through. Um, but considering how, what or what you said was harmful, um, being accountable for what was said and willing to apologize rethinking harmful assumptions or stereotypes. Cause again, we've all been brought up thinking different ways. Cause you know, our dad taught us this or our grandpa voted this way or whatever. Um, empathize with those on the receiving end of microaggressions. And that one, I wanna take just a second to talk about because a lot of times um, maybe some of us are part of a marginalized group. You know, many of us are, whatever it is, um, gender, race, sexuality, disability. Um, maybe a microaggression does not bother us as part of that group. Um, and, you know, maybe hearing something, well, it doesn't bother me and I'm part of that group. Um, well, it may definitely bother somebody else. So being able to empath empathize with those on the receiving end of microaggressions and realizing 
you know what, maybe this isn't on my radar, you know, I mean, I'll be genuine and, and on my end, um, you know, I certainly have personal experience with domestic violence and the scenario at the beginning, um, I never really thought twice about, you know, the, the phrase, take a stab at it or anything like that. Um, but I can see where it could really bother some people. And then support by offering resources and asking how you can help. And I'd just like to close with two quotes. Um, one from, of course, Maya Angelou, when you know better, do better. Um, a key thing for me when I put a training together is doing research. And I have to tell you, it was kind of disheartening in a lot of the research, you know, videos and articles and things. There's always the, always the adage, like, don't read the comments. And of course, I read the comments and the comments, even on this topic, mostly people being defensive and upset that, you know, people are trying to police our language again. And that's not what we're trying to do here. And I think she sums up the idea, you know, really well in her quote, you know, we all make mistakes. But when you know better, then you can go ahead and do better. And our final quote from basically the cultural soul mom, Dolly Parton, there's such a thing as innocent ignorance. And so many of us are guilty of that. As soon as you realize something is a problem, you should fix it. Don't be a dumbass. It's where my heart is. I would never dream of hurting anybody on purpose. And I think that's the key thing. None of us wants to hurt our coworkers, hurt our consumers, any of that. Um, so if we see something and we can do better, then we do. So thank you for letting us present this training. If you have any questions about it, any of our group would absolutely love to talk to you. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, Alice. That was awesome. Very good, Alice. Oh, thanks.